Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Lucero. I'm the Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion and Professor of Nursing here in the School of Nursing. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. We have about, um, for those of you who are on Zoom, uh, we have about, quickly, my math is about 10 to 12 people in the room. And the last I looked at Zoom, we have about 12 people on Zoom. So we have some nice attendance for this hybrid event uh, of our uh, 2023 winter special uh, lecture uh, put on by the Office of EDI. And this afternoon, we have Dr. Courtney James uh, to be our special lecturer. She was a PhD prepared nurse, pediatric nurse practitioner, and postdoctoral fellow in the National Clinician Scholars Program here at UCLA. Um, she earned her PhD and master's degree in nursing at Georgia State University in Atlanta. Uh, Dr. James' research focuses on supporting the physical and mental well-being of Black mothers, birthing people, and their families using a health equity lens grounded in the reproductive justice framework. Her program of research seeks to identify strategies that can be implemented to bonify clinicians' practice and healthcare policies to better serve, to better, sorry, to better serve uh, and improve the pregnancy-related health outcomes of Black women birthing people and their families, while also considering and addressing the influence of intersecting oppressions uh, that that on their uh, health and ability to receive quality care. So thank you, Dr. James, for agreeing to um, be our lecturer for the winter, um, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, thank you, and thank you everyone for uh, taking time to be here with me uh, this af afternoon. Yes, afternoon. Uh, you could have been anywhere, but you're here um, with me to discuss the importance of Black midwives then and now. They're, they're not advancing. Oh, oh this. While Dr. James is doing that, people on Zoom, if you have any questions during her presentation, feel free to uh, put those in the question answer icon button, not the chat, the question answer, and we'll get to those uh, in the discussion piece of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, so the objectives of my uh, lecture today will be to describe the marginalization and eradication of Black traditional midwives in this country, as well as explain the effect structural racism has on midwifery as a practice and then birth outcomes. And lastly, discuss ways that birth equity may be achieved at various levels. So just to provide an overview of the points that I will discuss today, we'll start with the orig origins origins, blah, 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 origins of midwifery in this country, um, specifically focusing on Black traditional midwives, then the origins of uh, gynecologic and obstetric medicine, the erasure of Black traditional midwives and the role that white public health nurses played, and then we'll discuss midwifery now. And so I think it's always important to discuss my positionality in, in this work, but in everything that I do, um, because my identities and lived experiences shape the way that I perceive and interpret uh, data in research or even history. Uh, so I'm a Black woman born and raised in the South. Um, I spent a few years of my childhood in Germany, thanks to my father in the Army. Um, I'm a mom and for context of this presentation, uh, I had a nurse practitioner and then an OB-GYN that pro uh, provided care to me. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner, so not a midwife, um, and I'm also a nurse scientist. So these roles and different identities definitely influence my work within this realm, but also how I am perceived. And so I'd like to start by acknowledging that um, although my presentation will focus on Black traditional midwives, that Native American and immigrant midwives are definitely affected and were present in this country uh, even long before 
well, not immigrant midwives, but Native American midwives were in this country long before Europeans colonized it, as well as before uh, enslaved Africans were brought here. And so I'd like to start, and this is kind of a rhetorical question you don't have to answer out loud, um, but what have you heard people say is the oldest profession? And so often we think of, exactly, we think of sex work, because if we look at history um, from like the male gaze, we often think about um, the female body in this regard, right? But I want to open your eyes that midwifery is actually the oldest practice. Um, and yes, so uh, people who immigrated here, like I was saying, immigrant midwives like Parteras from Latin America, all brought their culture um, and practices of midwifery to this country. So in regard to black midwifery in this country, um, it was brought, to the US in the 1620s uh, by kidnapped and enslaved Africans. And in West Africa, birth was seen as um, a process, a, a time of life to be celebrated. Uh, there were different rituals around childbirth and pregnancy. And because of this, it's rooted in traditional medicine and healing of West Africa. And so, midwives from Africa uh, provided care and attended births of all enslaved women and often their enslavers wives or mistresses as well. And so it's important to recognize the importance of midwifery in this time period because it ensured the continued profit and growth of the global economy. Why? Uh, because midwives ensured and cared for pregnant enslaved people and pregnant enslaved people create more people to be enslaved, therefore to work in the fields and support the global economy. And so at this time, white Europeans, the world, um, those who enslaved uh, Africans were very invested in midwifery as a practice. And so here you see um, Bridget Biddy Mason, who was a midwife and provided holistic care in, uh, to enslaved people. And we can talk more, but each slide will have a picture of a traditional, uh, black traditional midwife. And so often you may hear the terms like granny midwife or grand midwife when referring to black traditional midwives, but for uh, this talk, I will reference them as black traditional midwives. Um, it was a profession that they saw as a calling from a higher power, from God, and it was an extensive apprenticeship. So oftentimes, people who wanted to be Black traditional midwives trained under older midwives for years to learn different practices uh, that were passed down. And so they provided holistic care, like I said earlier, not just around pregnancy, but also using herbs. They were herbologists that they learned um, from West Africa and then adapted once coming into this country. They also used gardening to provide different foods um, as well as praying. Mid midwife in West Africa in some languages actually means spiritual healer. So they also, I mean, the true definition of holistic care. They were crucial to Black communities after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, because we often think about, you know, oh, the Emancipation Proclamation is amazing. It freed um, enslaved people. But quickly to follow was the American apartheid, which is Jim Crow in the 1880s. So even though Black people were free, were they really? Uh, they were not able to access care in hospitals or care from white physicians. And so Black traditional midwives still provided care to Black pregnant um, people, but also to their families, to their children, because there was no other health care service or uh, provider for them. And they also provided care to poor white women um, during their pregnancy and afterwards. So in this time period, Black traditional midwives attended up to 75% of all births in this country. 
And here's a quote from Shafia Monroe, who is the queen mother of midwifery in this country. And I'll speak more about her and all that she, she has done. Um, but to quote her, one of the darkest moments in US history was the systematic eradication of the African-American midwife from her community, resulting in a legacy of birth injustices. And so Black traditional midwives created a culture around the perception of birth, empowered men and women and families, and cared for people who were otherwise mistreated, marginalized, or ignored. And so to get rid of uh, Black traditional midwives, who some say are the soul of communities, has had and continues to have a really large impact. And so in order to discuss the eradication of Black traditional midwives, we have to um, discuss the origins of gynecological medicine as well as obstetric medicine. And so gynecological medicine grew in the 1800s. Um, I, I would generally say who, he who is not named, uh, but we have to name him uh, in order to have this discussion. But J. Marion Sims, who uh, some considered the father of gynecology, but we're getting away from that and acknowledging uh, the mothers of gynecology, Anarcha, Lucy, and Betsy. Um, but J. Marion Sims practiced and perfected skills on enslaved women in South Carolina and Alabama. And <clears throat> although there were many, we know the names of three, Anarcha, Lucy, and Betsy. And Anarcha, Lucy, and Betsy developed a vesico-vaginal fistula after childbirth due to the use of high forceps. And so J. Marion Sims used high forceps during childbirth, which then created these fistulas that then he experimented on them to repair. So he was the cause, and I guess you could say the solution, but um, to their condition. And so these women were not afforded decency. They were not covered. They did not consent because you know they were enslaved and were not offered anesthesia or medication to uh, address or repair the fistulas that they had. Once he perfected the procedure, he then moved up north and provided um, this surgery to white women where they were medicated, covered, consented, had the assistance of a nurse, um, during the procedure. <clears throat> then we have Dr. Joseph D. Lee. Uh, in 1915, he described childbirth as a pathologic process and treated it as such. He, at that time, had one of the most used textbooks to describe the standard of care for what we now call labor and delivery or childbirth. And so the standard of care were these steps that, he, <clears throat> excuse me, that he felt should be uh, implemented in every childbirth. So you start by sedating the woman during labor, allowing the cervix to dilate. Then you administer ether once fully dilated. And ether, um, I don't know if you all are familiar, thank you, with twilight sleep, but essentially the birthing woman was sedated to the point she was asleep and woke up after childbirth was completed and had no recollection of giving birth or the procedure itself. And so uh, after they were fully dilated, you cut an episiotomy, you perform a high forceps delivery, which if you're fully you know, asleep, you see how high those forceps pretty much have to go to then get the baby out, um, manually extract the placenta, provide medications for the uterus to contract, and then uh, repair the episiotomy. I would not sign up for that. Um, <laughs> that's, yeah, just no. Um, and I'm sure you could guess that with that standard of care uh, that Dr. D. Lee recommended, the outcomes of a, of a physician-led birth were pretty awful. Um, births attended by physicians had 87 deaths for every 10,000 live births, while Black traditional midwives had about 22 deaths. So that's about four times different. Um, and most physicians 
had very little training in providing birthing care or care for pregnant people at all um, until they were actually practicing in childbirth, like full on, hands on, this is when you learn. Uh, and so it showed based on these numbers, right? But instead of allowing the black traditional midwives to continue their practice and physicians handle surgeries, or even, you know, radical thought physicians learn from black traditional midwives, this was Dr. D. Lee's suggestion. It is generally admitted that more women die during confinement in the hands of doctors than midwives. The energy directed toward training midwives would be greater, would bring greater results if spent on the doctors. That just doesn't make sense to me. Um, if something is not broken, I can't even say fix it because this isn't a fix to then, you know, pathologize birth in that process and turning it over to physicians. Um, not to mention that Dr. DeLee and others were strategically discrediting black traditional midwives and creating the rhetoric that they were uneducated, practiced witchcraft or um, roots, which is um, related, aligns with uh, their knowledge of herbs and gardening. Um, and also that they were, you know, unclean or lazy, just all this negative rhetoric around uh, the term traditional uh, black midwives or granny midwives. And so when we say a system that is rooted in racism, this is what we mean in the mistreatment, the experimentation of uh, enslaved black women, but also then the strategic plan to discredit those who provide care to them because they are also black. And so here begins the shift in birthing practices. So at this time uh, in history, the majority of births still occurred in the home, even if a physician attended the birth. Um, but who attended the birth or provided care was determined by class and race. So nearly all births uh, of middle and upper class white women were attended by physicians, despite them having the worst health outcomes or pregnancy related outcomes. Uh, it was, you know, part of, I mean, it's racism, it's classism, it's no other way to put it, but because that's the only justification that would cause someone to seek care that they know they're risking their lives instead of getting care from a black traditional midwife. However, again, due to Jim Crow, uh, American apartheid, black traditional midwives still cared for uh, pregnant black women and poor white women. Um, around this time, which is around 1914, uh, white physicians and white uh, public health nurses began using the term nurse midwife, which is um, rather coded language to differentiate between black traditional midwives, who again, they're using this language that they're uneducated, they're unclean, they use witchcraft, um, and nurse midwife to designate or, you know, refer to white nurses who are educated, clean, um, American, all these things. So very coded language is being used. And then when we get into the different legislation involved in the erasure of the black traditional midwife, we think about the Medical Practice Act uh, in 1894, which I mean, this is still um, relevant today that if one state starts a law or passes a law, then the other states whose, um, I don't know, focus or beliefs or whatever align, then just copy and paste, right? We see this today. And so the Medical Practice Act said that no person other than a licensed physician would be allowed to practice obstetrics without facing criminal fines or imprisonment. Then we have the Flexner Report, which recommended birth in hospitals instead of in the home. So again, there are only certain people who can even afford or are allowed to birth in a hospital. And lastly, the Shepherd Tower Infancy and Protection Act, which was a federal law specifically to reduce white infant mortality. And it required that states regulate midwifery which again, if midwives have the best outcomes, why do 
we need laws to regulate them, but not physicians, but I digress. Um, and so all midwives were required to obtain a license after they were trained um, by physicians and white public health nurses. And so this law, the Shepherd Tower Act provided funding, bless you, provided funding to train and educate these uh, black traditional midwives. But if they have the best outcomes, who is training them and on what? And so this is where uh, the white public health nurses come in because the law funded either white male obstetricians or white female public health nurses to quote unquote educate black traditional midwives in normal birth. Mm. Um, but let's be real, obstetricians didn't believe in normal birth, right? Dr. D. Lee said it's a pathologic process that needs to be intervened upon and he had seven steps in which you are supposed to do so. Um, also, the real goal here was to standardize, professionalize, and medicalize midwifery. And so part of this was that the health departments would inspect the midwives' medical bags to ensure there were no unregulated items like herbs um, and roots that had been used for generations to help during the birthing process. If found with a non-state approved item or tool, black traditional midwives were subject to a $1,000 fine or 12 months in a chain gang. Um, and so they emphasized that midwives needed to be clean, their homes needed to be clean, even though they weren't providing care in their homes. Um, I mean, if people came to my home, I, okay, my home is my home is clean, right? It's neat. However, Depending on the day you come, if that's when you judge my ability to be a nurse, we may have some issues. Also, when we think about just the social context of how much money were Black women allowed to earn um, or who was going to pay them. Uh, many midwives were still working in the fields or working as maids in addition to being a Black traditional midwife. So all sorts of issues here. Um, but regardless, they knowingly and intentionally opted to eliminate these Black traditional midwives, stripping them of their livelihoods and leaving the people they serve without health care providers. Because if they're required to take this training and pay for a certificate, but don't earn enough to do so, then they're unable to legally, you know, not quote unquote, but to legally provide care to people who can't get care elsewhere. And so if you may, you may wonder, well, where else could, could Black women get training? Well, it was not at the Frontier Nursing Service, um, which was founded by Mary Breckenridge uh, in 1925. And she specifically recruited and trained white nurses to become nurse midwives, only white um, women. And she even recruited white women from England uh, to become midwives. And they also only cared for white families. Then she founded the Frontier Graduate School of Midwifery, which is still um, active today. Uh, and they did not admit or train black nurses until after her death in 1965, regardless of um, Brown versus the Board of Education, which said that, you know, separate but equal and all that wasn't working and we need to integrate schools, she still said no. Um, black nurses, Black women are not allowed, Black people, period, are not allowed to be in her midwifery school. She also founded the American Association for Nurse Midwives in 1940, which you could have guessed would not allow Black midwives uh, membership. And so her midwifery practice had the best outcomes of any, um, well, you know, they had great outcomes. They provided great care and had great outcomes even in uh, populations that were poor and maybe weren't expected to have those types of outcomes um, because she only provided care for white families who were very poor, but she felt like they were pure Anglo-Saxons and therefore um, there's some eugenics here and that she felt like they needed the care to increase their numbers and ensure the purity of 
I don't know, whiteness or whatever she was thinking. Um, but regardless, it's problematic, racist, um, and again, did not allow Black people uh, to enter and receive this training and education that all of a sudden was required. And so you may ask, well, where did the Black women go uh, to receive training to be either a midwife or a nurse midwife? Because these are still then and now are still two different practices. And so Tuskegee, Flint, Goodbridge, and Tuskegee Movable Schools um, were options for training. And so Tuskegee, of course, is in Alabama. Flint Goodridge was in New Orleans and was the only uh, hospital that provided care to Black people for almost 90 years. Um, and then the Tuskegee Movable School is the kind of looks like the car on wheels at the bottom where they would travel to rural areas uh, to provide training and information around midwifery and maternal care. And so those three schools trained 41 Black nurse midwives in the 1930s. Then we have the Maternity Care Association, which is uh, came about from that law that said, okay, if we require regulation and certification, then we need to provide training. In the course of 20 years, they trained eight Black midwives. So were they really trying to train Black midwives? I would say no, since uh, those three schools trained 41 in less time. And so just as an overview, I think it's important to review the timeline to illustrate how swiftly the change in practice from home births to hospitals, from um, not only black traditional midwives, but also immigrant midwives and Native American midwives, how they were, their practice, the legality of it um, was erased and less than, I mean, technically, we look at 1975 as the last black traditional midwife, but we see that the Medical Practice Act was in 19, 1894. So in less than 100 years, we went from black traditional midwives attending three fourths of all births to in 1973, 99% being births in hospitals. And again, because of who could be trained and who could be in hospitals, these weren't black midwives. And so now when we look at the demographics of the midwifery workforce today, uh, we could say that those um, laws and changes and practices are still effective uh, to this day because out of the 12,990 midwives that were, I don't, you know, there's a difference between being licensed or certified and practicing, right? So these are all the midwives who, have licenses um, and as of like August of 2020. Um, the overwhelming majority are white. The overwhelming majority are also certified nurse midwives. And this can correlate to the outcomes that we see as well um, because many certified nurse midwives work in the hospital and some have been socialized into the obstetric and gynecological medicine practices that I reviewed earlier. I mean, nobody. hopefully nobody is still using Dr. D. Lee's seven steps um, of child, you know, during childbirth, labor and delivery, but um, there is still some socialization around those beliefs um, and mistreatment of people that could go back and forth between certified nurse midwives and physicians. Um, as a culture, not necessarily as individuals, but just as how you are taught and how you practice. So when we look at the quote unquote supply of midwives and ob um, in this country as compared to other countries, uh, especially high income countries, we see the mix of midwives for ob gynes are very low in this country and the World Health Organization recommends midwives as an evidence-based approach to reducing maternal mortality. And so some experts note 
that high income countries with the lowest intervention, intervention rates, best pregnancy related health outcomes and lowest costs have integrated midwifery led care into their healthcare systems. So pretty much everyone except us in Canada, um, but Canada still has better health outcomes. And so in most countries, midwives greatly outnumber ob guys. For example, midwives provide most prenatal care and deliveries in the United Kingdom uh, and the Netherlands, countries considered to have amongst the strongest primary care systems in Europe, but of course, uh, the best health outcomes. And so sometimes people say, well, what about high-risk pregnancies, right? That the population in America of people capable of pregnancy, they tend, you know, maybe they're more ill, maybe there are higher levels of obesity here than in other countries, and therefore we can't use midwives as much because, you know, they specialize in low-risk births or low-risk pregnancies. And so that's a fallacy. Um, high-risk complications occur in six to eight percent of all pregnancies. And conditions like conditions that existed before pregnancy, like diabetes, or that developed during pregnancy, like preeclampsia, or even if you're pregnant with multiples, like twins or triplets, are reasons that an obstetrician or a maternal fetal specialist um, should be involved in the care during pregnancy, but not that they are the only provider of care during pregnancy. You could still have a collaborative care model with a midwife and a physician um, because still better outcomes with midwives. Um, and as you can see, and this is from uh, the University of California in San Francisco, the overwhelming majority of pregnancies are low risk. Um, and so the stipulation, it depends on what state you're in. The state pretty much uh, creates guidelines on who can attend births and where you can have give birth. But even if you do have a high risk pregnancy, quote unquote, you can receive care from a mid midwife throughout your pregnancy in collaboration with a physician. And then you may have to give birth in a hospital instead of a birthing center or at home. So still totally different than even what I learned or thought or was told. And so why are midwives important? We always say, you know, midwives have better pregnancy related health outcomes, but specifically uh, there's a higher rate of satisfaction with care, whether that's that pregnant people feel better prepared for labor and birth, uh, definitely advocate for patients and help them navigate um, their options. Uh, also, shorter hospital stays, fewer preterm births, less medical interventions, um, and also higher rates of vaginal birth after cesarean and higher, higher rates of vaginal birth in general, but definitely after cesarean, after cesarean birth. And so... These are some Black traditional midwives from, from the past, from way back then, who, you know, are, are the drivers of what we now call health equity and providing holistic care and caring for and providing birthing care through love and tradition because they cared about the people in their community because they were all in the same community. These weren't you know, somebody who just you drop in and check on them and you see if the baby's okay and then they're out. You're investing in their pregnancies because they're a part of your community. Um, and so just a few names that you may want to write down, learn about later, uh, like Bridget Biddy Mason, Mary Frances Hill Coley, Maud Colleen, uh, Ani Lee Logan, Margaret Ch Charles Smith, Tempe Avery, and many others, but they provided care when they weren't supposed to, when they weren't paid well, when they still had to work in fields to, to have any money to care for themselves. Um, and they cared for the entire family unit and the entire community. Um, Maud Collin, I, I don't know if I'm mispronouncing her last names, but um, was a nurse midwife in South Carolina. And because they were in a very rural area, would travel several counties to provide care to people. 
but also extended their home. Her and her husband extended the bedrooms in their home so that they could provide care to the children who were born, but also their husbands who needed health care and couldn't go to a hospital. So really the, the heartbeat of the Black community were Black traditional midwives. And so um, even though the practice changed and you know black mid black traditional midwives were intentionally pushed out of birth and care um i my heart is warm to say i know a lot of these uh beautiful women but um also that the practice still lives on and these uh women like kimberly durden and allegra hill in the top left of kindred space la here um, in Inglewood have the only black woman led midwifery practice in all of Southern California. Um, and they uh, are again, a part of the community because their birth center is in the community um, and provide care to all pregnant people, um, even with Medi-Cal. Uh, and so then we have Dr. Michelle Drew, who is in Delaware, who is a nurse midwife with a community birth center as well. Um, Jenny Joseph, who is from, I guess we're, we still say England. Um, I get so confused. United Kingdom, Britain, I don't know. But she's from England. Um, and her uh, common sense childbirth is in Florida, another community birth center with amazing outcomes um, just because of person centered care and also acknowledging what we call as the social determinants of health, but providing holistic care and support for whatever needs that a woman birthing person and their families have. Um, Rebecca Polston of Roots Community Birth Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Then we have the San Antonio nurse midwife who obviously is in San Antonio, Texas. And then um, the queen mother of um, midwifery, the midwifery movement is Shafia Monroe in the bottom right, who has worked since the 70s um, to reduce Black infant and maternal mortality rates. Um, she's a midwife, doula trainer, and cultural competency trainer. And so she co-founded what is now known as the National Association to Advance Black Birth uh, to increase the number of midwives and doulas of color to empower families, reduce infant and maternal mortality, and bring Black midwives together. And so when we talk about the importance of cultural congruence, meaning that if your clinician looks like you may be familiar with certain hardships that you may experience because of how you show up in this world or how other people perceive you, that's important. And so if the majority of midwives are of one demographic, there isn't much cultural congruence. And so, um, you know, there needs to be more diversity. That's easier said than done. Um, but we also need to utilize midwives more um, and ensure that more finish and, and practice and think about holistic um, birth and care. And so if there are questions, I'll take them. But these can be points of discussion, but also points to ask yourself and maybe think about. Uh, but first, like any experiences or thoughts you would like to share, you don't have to. But then when thinking about pregnancy and postpartum care in this country, because I uh, gave this talk um, actually in London over the summer, um, I was there for a maternal health policy elected for a month and got to work with midwives and just see all the things. And yes, socialized medicine, but it's not just socialized medicine. Um, and thinking about what would you change or what do you even love about the current system now? Um, how do you think increasing diversity within midwifery would impact birthing outcomes? And what do you think are some, are some barriers to increasing the midwifery workforce? And what are some solutions? Because oftentimes we hear about certain regulations, certain disciplines that don't want um, midwives to, to function at their full scope um, or to outnumber obstetricians. Um, but still needs to be done still have to think of thoughts and and come up with ideas to to make it happen because at the end of the day if the goal is to ensure that my my particular interest is black women and birthing people specifically but that if all pregnant um, women and birthing people or people capable of pregnancy 
are able not only to just survive pregnancy, right? You know you're in a bad state when you frame maternal health as surviving pregnancy, um, but they thrive and are able to live and raise their children. What it takes for that outcome to happen is worth, you know, the ends justify the means, like whatever has to be done. And so I think we're at a point now where egos and other things need to come out um, of the equation and um, reform healthcare, um, insurance reimbursement, education, like nursing education to ensure that those outcomes are attainable um, and to progress towards and experience health equity. Because I don't think health equity is achievable is what we experience. Um, and so we need to move towards that. That's it, that's all I got. So we're going to get started in the, uh, the discussion phase. Thank you, uh, Dr. James. Uh, I just have to say that this is like really close to, let me turn this way so people on Zoom can see me. Uh, uh, this is really something I care about a lot. I think you know this about me. I'm a high, I'm a high risk labor and delivery nurse oh, by no. training. Yes. And so it caused me to sit here and reflect that, you know, it's unique in so many ways that I'm, you know, I self-identify as a male and I was a male on a, on a labor and delivery unit. But as I was listening to your presentation, I was like, is there another person of color on the unit? Mm -hmm. And it was all white female, mm -hmm. except for one Latinx male, which mm -hmm. then compounded by the fact that we were in Yuma, Arizona. Oh, it's a, a, a wow. US Mexico border town. And it was all essentially all white female wow. nurses caring for a largely Latinx population. So my first question, and people can start thinking about their questions and on Zoom, um, and then we're going to put the pizza here, Lisa, if you will, and people can come down and get the pizza. Sorry, it was a little late. Um, is do you have um, knowledge of even at the staff level, the registered nurse distribution mm -hmm. of labor and delivery nurses in terms of race, ethnicity? That's a great question. I do not know the answer specifically um, as far as, as race. And I should know this because I've engaged in conversations about this. Um, but, but thinking just about the different disciplines within nursing, or I guess you could say the different levels of nursing, like um, associate degree nurses are licensed practical or vocational nurses versus bachelor's prepared registered nurses. I know the demographic between those is that, um, no, not oh, that's you, that's um, that oftentimes licensed practical nurses are, are Black women, um, overwhelmingly Black women, and that's due to different barriers that they may face in obtaining a bachelor's degree or the times in their lives where they're seeking education and how long they can remain in college without, you know, making an actual living wage. Um, and so I know that there is some differences racially there as far as the level of education, but not specifically for labor and delivery nurses. I have talked with, and this is related but not directly answering your question. But even within labor and delivery nurses, when I speak with doulas or labor and delivery nurses who were first doulas, the, the knowledge that they have around the birthing process is completely different. Mm -hmm. And so again, even though nursing talks about holistic care, if when we look at the history of nursing and um, obstetrics in this country, if white public health nurses were aligned closely with white obstetricians and those thought processes and culture was shared, when we think about pathologizing the birthing process, so the knowledge that doulas have versus the knowledge that nurses have are completely different. Um, doulas definitely are there to support that natural birthing process, allow gravity, position changes, different um, 
techniques to naturally allow this process to happen. Whereas nurses are often trained to intervene, to know how to work machines, to know if something is going wrong, what to do then but not so much in just being present and helping someone transition through a natural process. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity even there to learn from each discipline. Um, and so there should be some cross-training, cross-education even there. Because even though we say like midwives have better outcomes and yes, you can have a home birth. But I like, I don't know if I would want a home birth. It sounds great. But I would just like to be in water, like in the hospital, um, because that would be where I'm most comfortable. And any woman and birthing person should be wherever they're most comfortable. They should be able to have the birth that they want, right? And so if someone chooses to not have a lot of interventions, but still give birth in the hospital, then the staff and the nurses should know the same things that a doula would know in order to assist them and support them in that process. So I think that didn't really answer your question, but that's what came to my mind. Um, so you did answer. I think you you partly answered Lauren's uh, question on on Zoom, which is, do you support home births? I think you answered that. Mm -hmm. um, but and so what I'd like to do is turn to our audience here live at the UCLA School of Nursing um, and see if people have questions. And we do have a question, Dr. Beck. Okay, Dr. James, thank you. That was amazing. Um, and I know that um, you are a change agent in this area and you um, do incredible research. And I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about your research for um, everyone here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I should, I should have my elevator pitch by now. Um, <laughs> We always talk about that elevator pitch. And I do have an elevator pitch, but um, so like I said, my goals are really to ensure that black women and birthing people have the birthing experience that they desire and are here to raise their children. Um, and so in order to do that, I plan to and have begun uh, conducting research that includes them in their voice, not just as research participants, but as creators of the interventions, um, because oftentimes, you know, if you're in your bubble and academia is, can be completely different than real life, you may be in your office or in your class and think of the best intervention that you thought of. Uh, and then you can even get the funding and then the community is like, we're not doing that. Um, so no, it doesn't really work. Or um, that there are other more pressing issues that are important to them and not your intervention. And so I think it's important to include black women and birthing people in the work to center their voice and ensure that uh, solutions being made are pertinent to them, um, but also to use a reproductive justice and health equity framework uh, to, to get these outcomes. And so I've recently, um, revised and resubmitted a paper about the effects of discrimination during childbirth on postpartum care use. And so we know that postpartum care is really crucial in identifying risks that could lead to maternal death. And so if, if someone is mistreated and therefore does not want to seek care, there's missed opportunities to avoid a death. And so just, again, I focus on clinical or healthcare level factors that influence pregnancy related health outcomes. I choose not to focus on individual behaviors or choices because often individual be behaviors or choices are shaped by upstream factors like healthcare policies, clinicians, um, uh, delivery care, delivery of care, as well as, you know, legislation. And so we have to first be most impactful and making bigger change by addressing those upstream factors instead of individual um, decisions. So that's like my research in a nutshell. I have a lot of papers going on. I have some uh, grants that I've applied to to 
specifically revise and reform nursing practice and nursing education and how we interact with those who come to us for care. Any other questions here in the audience? Yes. And while I'm walking to Dean John, I do want to make a comment to our students in the audience. What? Oh, behind me. Oh, you were pointing at her. <laughs> that, so for our students, you know, I hope you'll reflect on what Dr. James said about the role of nurses and nursing, and nursing care um, in our health system. Because I would actually suggest, and having practiced there, right, that it's kind of schizophrenic when you're working with midwives and physicians as a nurse because you're playing two different roles depending on who the provider is. But really for the students to think about as you're learning to become nurses, how much you as a nurse, regardless of the setting, how much of your nursing practice becomes medicalized and is not nursing. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm a nursing student from UCLA, and um, thank you for this amazing talk. Uh, my name is Shalini, and um, I had a question, and my friend brought me this question before, and so I still like want to answer that, but wanted to get your insight. Um, when it comes to home births, um, when I was a doula, I got to like really support women and hold space for them when they're in the bathtub. And it just made them so calm and relaxed and like it like expedited like the process of them delivering their baby. So I really love home births and water births. But um, now when I was like studying in nursing, like infection rates are the big topics of discussion. And I was wondering when women are exposed to water and like their babies exposed to that water, um, does that increase the rate of infection for the baby? So I would say no. However, I feel, you know, as a scientist, I always have to have evidence-based research to support that. So I will get, I'll get your email and I'll provide sources to that information. But I would say no, because there's no fetal scalp monitoring. There's no um, like break that could introduce infection. And so, although they are in the water, usually that's a very sterile, um, clean like it's sometimes they imp bring in these sterilized that have been deep cleaned and all these things uh either tubs or like the blow up baths but to my knowledge increased infection is not a, a side effect of water births um whether in the home or in the hospital um but I could definitely provide evidence based information for your friends so they'll be more informed but yeah that's not a thing I I think oftentimes in hospitals and healthcare systems, it's what's most convenient and most feasible, uh, depending on the volume of clients and patients that they would serve. Now, hospitals in the UK, when I was there, they provide water births and there are tubs in each room and they deep clean and sanitize just like they would any other machinery or equipment in the room. And that's not a barrier and it's not related to infection. Um, my happy place is in the water. So, you know, partly why I moved to LA. But so I, yeah, it doesn't. But I'll, I'll get your email. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. James. My name is Nanzai. Um, I may not have a question, but I have a comment. When you share the histories, and it made me think about when we teach philosophy of science for the PhD students, we call epistemology, which is the wor where the nursing knowledge came from. This whole history was missing. So when I was in the AAC essential leader, uh, leadership team, mm -hmm. and when they talk about the history of nursing, who actually developed the nursing as a discipline and a science, and the black leaders, including the one with Florence Nightingale, Mm -hmm. The person name was missing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the important pieces, not only education, but also in policy. The second thing I want to comment on you is to say how they systemic and eliminate and eliminate what we nursing always embracing holistic care. 
but it's simply because it's a black traditional midwife wifery. So my third one actually is the question, and even though you are mitigate the risk for the postpartum for the women, but the United States still have a higher state infant mortality rate. I would like to hear what your take on that. On the infant mortality rate, okay. I'll, I'll circle back to that one and then just say that I agree with your comments about not only in nursing, but in general, whose knowledge is deemed as evidence-based or what is valued, um, what is respected. Um, because as researchers, I mean, we seek the lived experiences of people in the community, and then we just package it up and share it in a different way. But that is also knowledge and expertise and wisdom that is often not looked at or looked at as anecdotal um, in comparison to like academic research. So yes, I think that even in the theory of nursing and, and looking at the history of nursing as far as Florence Nightingale, and which can also, also has problematic parts of history um, and, and who we choose to, to think about as knowledge and experts in nursing and wisdom. So I agree that that there definitely needs to be a change in focus and, and thoughts there. Um, as far as infant mortality, hmm, I, I'm sure there are like specific drivers as to why this occurs. Um, I've practiced in mother baby care uh, for since like 2006 until right before I moved here, like almost two years ago. So a long time, however long that is, you know, I don't mind my age. I think we're supposed to get older. So I'm totally fine in, in showing my age, but um, I worked at the highest volume hospital in the country. And so we had around 25,000 births a year, very busy. Um, and so in thinking about infant mortality, um, but also just a lot of premature preterm births and different conditions. Part of that, I think, is technological advancements, too, and that we're able to, uh, I don't want to misspeak, I'll have to look more into it, but I think it all relates to the type of care that is provided and the focus of the care um, during pregnancy and afterwards. I know plenty of countries have preconception care to ensure that when a person becomes pregnant, they're their healthiest self before they become pregnant, to try to avoid any adverse health outcomes. And so maybe that's also a part that's missing in the healthcare system in this country is that once you're pregnant, let's try to address your high blood pressure or let's try to address your diabetes or whatever may develop. But if we can address that before people become pregnant and make sure that they're doing well, then that may not only improve pregnancy related outcomes, but also the newborn's health outcomes. But I need to look more specifically into newborn care because I've sort, sort of gotten away from that. Well, that's a perfect way to end. Last question. Thank you everybody for coming. Keep an eye out for our uh, spring uh, special lecture, which will be in May. Um, uh, so you can save the date for that. Uh, keep that in mind. Uh, and thank you, Dr. James. Yeah. Everybody, please come and have some pizza before you leave. Take it with you to class, to your office, wherever you're going next. <laughs>